Center for Inquiry, Canada's premier venue for secular humanists, atheists, skeptics, and free thinkers. Thanks for having me here, and thanks for showing up. And, uh, and not going to the big talk downstairs, which is, what is it, economy and the two billion or something like that? Seven. Oh, seven seven billion. billion. Oh, yeah. Oh. We've got more billions than us. Economy and the seven billion. But um, we are continuing our celebration of Darwin, um, that <coughs> is now expanded to the whole month of February. We can think about cool topics like evolution, but we're going to weave a lot of, uh, of history in there as well. So um, I teach evolutionary biology, and uh, I really have a passion for the subject of evolution, which got me interested in the life of Charles Darwin as well. And so I'm really interested in sort of the historical roots of evolution. That's something that I've just been off and on reading about and interested in for, for quite some time. And so uh, I like to share my uh, enthusiasm about Charles Darwin and his life. And uh, this time I thought I'd talk about the people surrounding Charles Darwin rather than the man himself, because we hear a lot about him, but we don't know quite so much about his personal life, about his scientific life. So we'll meet some of these people that we see up here on the screen. Um, as was mentioned, I sometimes dress up as Charles Darwin uh, himself. I did this for Darwin Day at uh, Science World. We had a lot of fun, had a great turnout. It was a really great evening. And um, I've been doing that for about eight years or so. Uh, I do a younger version of Charles Darwin, sort of when he was in his uh, Voyage of the Beagle, or writing, preparing to write The Origin of Species. Um, Darwin, rather than the, the guy with the big white bushy beard and the, and the bald head, um, which is what most people know about Darwin. But I like to promote that, hey, this is the Darwin that was traveling around the world. He was the one that was first thinking about how evolution could come about through natural selection. So we've got to celebrate that guy as well. Um, this is me at the BD Biodiversity Research Center and Museum at UBC. Uh, I do a lot of events there, I mean, do it the other day. We do a bake a cake for Darwin every year, uh, right around his birthday time as well, and we have some wonderful cake entries. That's open to the public, so keep your eyes open for that if you're interested. The, the BD is a wonderful place to explore biodiversity. And, uh, and I also had to throw this picture in. This is a picture of me dressed up as a, as a young Darwin with um, an administrator from University of the Fraser Valley who invited me out some years ago to speak about Darwin. And uh, the other guest speaker to her left is the great-great-grandson of Charles Darwin. Mm -hmm. uh, his name is Sir James Barlow Baronet, creationist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he is, he is. Um, he does, he has no problem with, uh, with Darwin and the family history and the family legacy. And so I think he's, he's fairly pro-science as far as creationists go. Um, but uh, like, for example, he, he works for the Galapagos Foundation promote uh, scientific uh, understanding and preservation. Um, but yeah, it was a little awkward sharing a stage. <laughs> Very nice guy. Very nice guy. Um, so I wanted to explore what we know about Darwin, what we think we know about Darwin, and maybe, maybe learn a few cool things about his life that you didn't know previously. So I've got a collection of different Darwin pictures. As I said, I really like to promote the young Darwin. I love the fact that he's on your poster for, for next month. Um, because it's always the guy with the bushy white beard. And uh, I want to promote the idea that there's, there's other Darwins that are out there, have been out there as well. So I love these pictures of, of a younger beardless Darwin. Uh, he didn't grow the beard until he was much older, and so most of his life he looked like this. Um, but it's that bearded Darwin because he looks like some sort of Greek philosopher or sage that people really love the images of, and people love playing with the image. I like these finches making us his beard. There he is, hugging Tiktaalik, his inner fish. And uh, I just collect all sorts of odd little weird pictures of Darwin. There's a Matrix version there. And I love this one too. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Probably seen this one before. Play on the Obama poster. Um, but this means that we've all seen pictures of Darwin. We've all heard about him. Those who came to my monologue probably know a bit more about his personal life. But really, how much else do we know? So that's what the question we're going to be asking today. Um, who is the man sort of behind the science, behind the, behind the natural selection, <coughs> and the monkeys, and the, and the evolution. Um, so I want to say very little about Darwin himself. We're going to explore him through his relationships. Uh, but I will mention um, sort of just the highlights. This is a um, middle-aged Darwin 
who had just published The Origin of Species. And he had been thinking about this for 20 years, since as a young man he voyaged um, around the world on the voyage of the Beagle as the naturalist. And uh, this was one of his pages of his earliest journals, where he started thinking about a way to understand what he saw around him in the world, the observations he had made. He had been taught, and most scientists and most people in England and most of Europe and the rest of the world at the time thought that every creature was created as they are, never changing. And as he started to travel from place to place, particularly in South America and the Galapagos in Australia, um, he saw evidence with his own eyes that something didn't match up. There were things that were kind of similar to each other, but living in different places, but close by, little islands off the mainland. It just wasn't quite fitting. This idea of evolution had been in the air for some time. He was certainly not the first to propose that species changed, or that they might be related. But nobody had worked out a viable mechanism, a process that could explain this. And so it was Darwin who really started thinking very seriously about this problem, how species could come about, and how they could be related to one another and change over time. So in 1859, he finally released what he called his little abstract. He was looking, working on a much, much larger book, but he was kind of, his hand was pushed, and so he decided to, to publish the, the Origin of Species, um, which he wasn't quite satisfied with at the time, and he thought he at least would get his idea out there, and the evidence that he had been amassing for 20 years. So what was he primarily interested in? Even though that's the title, <coughs> he really had very little to say about how species got started, or how life got started. Mostly he was talking about that mechanism, that process how the evolutionary change happens. And so he introduced the world to the idea of natural selection. And in his own words, it was this principle by each slight variation of an organism, an animal or a plant, for example, and he was talking about the traits of these organisms, each slight variation, if that variation is useful, it will be preserved. And individuals that have traits that are not useful, and what he meant by useful was surviving, having offspring, contributing to the next generation, then they, those traits would not be preserved. And so nature itself would be selecting how these traits would change over time. And this can lead to the diversity that he saw around him in the world. So um, Darwin lived at uh, a place called Down House, in the, nearby the town of Down, which was only 12 miles from London. Now it seems like it would be you know, a suburb of the city. But back then it was out in the countryside. It was much further away. Um, so he could be close enough to London to be able to correspond with scientific folks, but he left, lived a very retiring life with his wife and with his family. <coughs> um, this is Down House. I was lucky enough to visit it in 2009, which was the big anniversary year for Darwin, his 200th birthday and 150 years since the publication of The Origin. And uh, it's a really wonderful place. If you ever have a chance to visit, if you ever find yourself in England or near London, it's absolutely worth the visit. There's a museum upstairs, which has some really wonderful things, but all of the downstairs and all of the grounds and the gardens have been restored as they would have been in Darwin's time. And so walking his sand walk, where he came up with a lot of his philosophical ideas, uh, or checking out his garden or his uh, greenhouse where he grew plants was just really um, a fabulous experience. And so I didn't take this picture. I found it on the web, but this picture I did take. Um, and this is a recreation of his office, his study, where he did his work. So that's the actual room where he did his writing, where he observed his barnacles and all the rest of it. And you'll notice they have put a couple of photographs, sorry, one photograph and two illustrations of some important people in Darwin's life above his um, fireplace. And uh, we're going to touch upon each of those three people as we go on to talk about some of Darwin's influences. So. Um, Charles Robert Darwin, you'll see how both of those names pop up an awful lot in the family, uh, was born in 1809 and lived until 1882. And uh, so you can see that picture of him was painted when he was about 30 years old. And uh, I don't expect you to be able to read all of these names, but uh, I do have a copy of uh, one of the family trees. This one um, ends with Charles Darwin and traces his, his ancestry. This is backwards in time, his parents, his grandparents, their parents, and so on. And so if anybody's curious, we can talk about this. But I will just point out um, that we are going to talk about his father and his mother. Uh, we're going to talk about his grandfather, Josiah. And we're going to talk about his other grandfather on his paternal side, uh, Erasmus Darwin.
to um, a number of his ancestors, and then we'll also move to his contemporaries, his friends, and his major scientific influences as well. And uh, if you guys want, you can always stop me at any point with questions. So I'm just going to give a little bit of a blurb, a bio about each person, but if you're curious to learn more, uh, we can chat about it. Or if you have information to share with the group, experiences beyond what I know, uh, I would love for anybody to chime in at any time. So please stop me. So we're going to start with Erasmus, um, <coughs> who was a really incredible guy. Uh, if Charles Darwin had not become one of the most famous scientists in history, um, we would still know the name Darwin from Erasmus Darwin, because he was an amazingly uh, prolific and influential man of his time. Uh, he was one of these guys that just did everything. Back then, a lot of these people who were interested in science and nature and industry just did everything. He was a doctor, uh, quite a successful doctor, as was his son, Charles's father. And uh, he was a scientist, an inventor. Uh, he was a poet, so he didn't just confine himself to the sciences. And he was thinking about evolution a long time before uh, many, most other people, I would say, in the world. Most other scientists, and certainly much earlier than uh, his, his famous grandson. Uh, he was one of the founders of a group called the Lunar Society. And uh, this was a group of really influential thinkers. We can't really label them. They did everything, like I said, <coughs> science, industry, arts, crafts. They did it all. Um, and it included people like Josiah Wedgwood, who we'll come back to. You may have heard of Wedgwood pottery. Um, it included people like Matthew Bolton and James Watt, who were famous for developing and uh, popularizing the steam engine, and so sort of leading in the Industrial Revolution in Europe. And uh, people like Joseph Priestley, who is, if you look him up in Wikipedia, he'll tell you he's famous for discovering oxygen. Although, I think oxygen was probably there before <coughs> Joseph Priestley <coughs> discovered it. But he did a lot of really important experiments dealing with gases and chemistry and, uh, and oxygen and um, was incredibly influential in that area. So I have a book to suggest. Um, Fred looked it up for me. The author is uh, Jenny Uglo? Uglo? Uglo, maybe. Yeah. U-G-L-O-W. Yeah. And uh, it's called The Lunar Society. Or the, the Lunar Men. Oh, The Lunar Men. And the subtitle is Five Friends Whose Curiosity Changed the World. So it's a really nice book, and it talks about all these folks. It talks about Erasmus, and it talks about Josiah, and it talks about Priestley and Watt. And, uh, and their friendship <coughs> really changed the world in some pretty profound ways, for good or for bad. Um, but getting back to uh, Erasmus, he published um, several volumes of botanical verse which nowadays is not the kind of thing that you hear about all the time. So it was really good science, but he was using his verse, his poetry, to spread the science to the masses. And uh, he is probably best known for a work called Zoonomia, which was using rhyming couplets to discuss scientific topics. And uh, you'll, I'm going to read you a little part of this. I'm very excited about reading Erasmus Darwin. It's, it's just beautiful, beautiful words. Um, but you might see, you might recognize the sound of these kinds of rhyming couplets. Remember, this was back in the 1700s. And so this influenced, heavily influenced, people like Wordsworth, Keats, Byron, Coleridge. We think of those people as the influencers, but they, in turn, had influencers as well. And so Erasmus Darwin was, uh, was a huge influence in so many different areas. So, um, here we go. I'm just gonna I'm gonna share some of Erasmus Darwin's words with you. First, some couplets, and then um, some prose that he wrote about science. Go on, O oh friend, explore with eagle eye, where wrapped in night, retiring causes lie. Trace their slight bands, their secret haunts betray, and give new wonders to the beam of day. Till link by link, with step aspiring trod, you climb from nature to the throne of God. So saw the patriarch with admiring eyes, from earth to heaven a golden ladder rise. Involved in clouds, the mystic scale ascends, and brutes and angels crowd the distant ends. So what I really like about that verse is that at first reading you're like, wait a minute, was this guy talking religiously? Was he saying, trying to marry religion and science? Because that's what everybody at the time was doing. 
science showed God's wonderful plan, and we could, through science, understand religion. But the catch is, and the reason I wanted to share this with you guys, is that Erasmus Darwin was an atheist. And so he was writing this to draw in his readers. He was saying, you guys admire God, you understand it, you believe that there's this great chain of being that connects earth to heaven. Well, let's imagine this ladder, and let's take a closer look at it, and look at all these steps. They're actually connected. So we can imagine this connection through life. And so he gets people to buy into this connection. Now we can say, wow, imagine if there was a first cause. We don't know what it was. But this first cause then began to change over time. It began to connect to all living things. And, and so people are going, yeah, 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 I, I agree. I agree, it sounds great. And he's like, great, well, we just settled evolution then. So it's sort of this backdoor <laughs> argument into evolution. It's like, oh, you can imagine a first cause? Totally. Can you imagine all life connected? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great, me too. I think it all evolved. All that we need to do is imagine that something started it. I don't know what that was. You can call it God, and I can call it whatever I want. So he did believe in some sort of first cause that was unknown by, by man. And his grandson did it as well. His grandson, Charles Darwin, was not a atheist. He also wasn't a theist. He was, well, maybe a theist, a weak theist. He said, we just don't know. Something caused it, we don't know what it was. But since then, scientific rules allow us to understand how things changed. So to contrast that sort of religious sounding analogy um, Erasmus used, um, here are some other words that Erasmus wrote, not rhyming. Um, but you'll see his flair for the drama, how he sort of captured this idea. He said, would it be too bold to imagine that in one great length of time since the earth began to exist, perhaps millions of ages before the commencement of the history of mankind, would it be too bold to imagine that all warm-blooded animals have arisen from one living filament, which the great first cause endued with animality, with the power of acquiring new parts, attended with new propensities, directed by irritations, sensations, volitions, and associations, and thus possessing the faculty of continuing to approve by its own inherent activity, and of delivering down those improvements by generation to its posterity, world without an end. So he still has that sort of poetic spark to it, the sort of grandiose um, ideas, but what is he suggesting? He's suggesting evolution. He's suggesting that everything's connected and it changes on its own form. So I want to point out again, evolution was widely accepted, well, not widely, it was accepted by certain people at the time, but they didn't know how it happened. They had no mechanism. So that's where we're leading with this story. Erasmus so, died a few years before Charles Darwin was born, so they never knew each other in life. That's he, right. he must have been exposed to his writings. So he was exposed to his writings, and he said he did read bits of Zoonomia when he was a young man, and he also said it didn't make much of an impression on him. <laughs> That's what Charles claimed. And so people always asked, they said, oh, well, your, your grandfather's thinking must have influenced your ideas in evolution. And he's like, not really. Uh, <laughs> you know, to me it just seemed like a big analogy for God, and, you know, and... and and uh, he didn't really get that part. He didn't really believe it at that point. He wasn't receptive to it, I guess, then. So like when Darwin was on, when Charles was on uh, the legal, he was still quoting the Bible word for word, believed it literally. So when he was a younger man, he, he, he claims he was not influenced by his grandfather's thinking. However, the family shared this thought. They were free thinkers. Uh, they weren't strong um, theists, all of them. Uh, those that were religious were Unitarian. I remember free thinkers in the family that were not Unitarian. And uh, they were abolitionists. Uh, they had very progressive ideas. And so that whole family that thinking that Erasmus may have in view with the rest of his family probably did have a big effect on Charles Darwin's life. But we need to keep moving on. So this is Josiah Wedgwood. Um, he was the grandfather to both Charles Darwin and Charles's future wife, Emma Darwin. You probably know that they were cousins. Um, two of his children uh, had children that then later married, who were Charles and Emma. And we'll get to both of those as well. Uh, he was creator of the Wedgwood Pottery Company, um, which was hugely successful. As I mentioned, one of the members of the Lunar Circle, the Lunar Society. And um, that was a pottery group that started as a small endeavor and just got bigger and bigger and more and more successful. And a large part of that was because he was exchanging these ideas with these scientific thinkers and they were on the cutting edge of 
chemistry and material science, and they were inventing new processes and inventing new ways to make pottery and better pottery all the time. So he was a very, very, very wealthy man. His um, huge estate made it possible eventually for <coughs> Charles's uh, dad and Charles himself to live quite comfortably without having to really work much. And so that had a big influence on, uh, on Charles later on as well. Um, Josiah's right leg was amputated actually at the age of 14 when he was suffering from smallpox. So he had one leg for most of his life and still managed to, uh, to get around just fine and, uh, and do some amazing things with his, uh, his pottery. And so the Wedgwood name is still quite famous. They were potters to the queen for, for a long time. And um, a lot of his family worked in the pottery <coughs> as well. So Josiah married uh, Sarah, who was known as Sally, Sally Wedgwood. Um, her name was Wedgwood actually before they married as well. They weren't closely related, but they were distant cousins. So they both shared the name Wedgwood, and they could trace their ancestry back um, a number of generations to uh, the same, same people. Um, he, she was much better educated than most women of her time. Um, and she came from a family of Unitarians, and so she was the one who brought the Unitarian religion into the family, which was then passed on to a lot of the members of the family, not so much to Charles's branch, but to Emma's branch for sure. And Emma grew up in the Unitarian faith. And if you're not familiar with what that is, um, basically it's an offshoot of Christianity that doesn't believe in the Trinity. That's sort of one of their main tenets. And so the Unitarian is that there is only one God, so they were religious, but they weren't quite so strict with all the rules as, as the Church of England and Catholicism and, and a number of these other religions at the time. And in fact, Josiah, who we already mentioned was probably an atheist, um, called Unitarianism uh, a feather bed for the Christians that fell. So they kind of <laughs> fell away from the religion, but they landed on this nice, comfortable feather bed of Unitarianism. So they could still have their beliefs, but they didn't have to worry about all those crazy rules that the Pope has. <laughs> um, but... Because she was Unitarian, they had, like I said, they had a lot of progressive views, and so they were champions of things like religious freedom, women's education, stuff that at the time was not always widely held in all society. And so this is the kind of um, family that, uh, that both Charles and Emma's parents grew up in. So this is uh, Susanna Suki Darwin, uh, whose um, maiden name was Wedgwood. Uh, she was uh, Josiah's firstborn child, and she was Charles's mom. She married uh, Robert Darwin in 1796, and he was also from a pretty well-off family, but she was really wealthy. So she increased the wealth of the family quite a big deal with a very large dowry from her uh, father, Josiah. That seems like a fairly late marriage for the time. She would have been 31. So she married, I think I, I just said it, and I forgot as soon as I said it, in 1796. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, well, they were a pretty unconventional family. They did a lot of things different. Erasmus, for example, I didn't mention, had uh, two wives and a pretty publicly known mistress affair. And between the three women, he had 14 children. Hmm. It's a pretty big family. <laughs> so he, um, I think he married fairly late, and then his first wife died, and then so his second marriage was very late, and then when she was, I guess, no longer interested in having kids, he found someone else who was, and, uh, <laughs> and then they lived together after his second wife died. So, yeah, he was a man of, uh, got around. <laughs> man of big appetites. Um, and, uh, and you'll see that was true of, uh, of Charles's dad as well. So Susanna was the Wedgwood, but she married, oh, and I also wanted to mention, she, she attended the Unitarian Church in, in Shrewsbury, where um, she was the one who influenced Charles to attend a Unitarian school when he was young. So for two years, Charles attended a Unitarian school, his first school, operated by a Reverend Case, and Charles was not so into learning, didn't enjoy the school, so he got nothing out of it. But uh, there's probably some religion tied into it as well. Um, so here is Robert Waring Darwin, who was a large man indeed. Um, he was the one who married Suki and uh, was Charles's father. He was also a physician, like um, Erasmus, 
And he was big not only on girth, but he was six foot two at the time. That was really big. Now it's still pretty big. And um, obviously really large. In fact, I bet you they cut off 100 pounds for this painting to make him look nice and uh, smelt. Um, and so Charles said that uh, he was the largest man he had ever seen in his life, his dad was. And when he came home at the end of the day, he said it was like the coming in of the tide. <laughs> Robert Waring Darwin would enter the house. He had to have special steps made to the house because the wooden ones wouldn't hold his, his size. And so he had special steps to the house and special steps to get up onto his horse and into his carriage. And he'd have his servants test the floors of houses when he did house calls because they had to make sure that he wasn't going to go right through the floor of the of the old wooden house. Um, my last Robert Waite comment that I have to make because it's so interesting is he actually was so big that he cut a hole out of his dining room table so he could pull himself up to his dining room table and still reach his plate and his fork and everything like that. He wouldn't have been able to reach the table if he had sat without this giant hole cut out of it. Um, but once again, he was just this man who just had a huge appetite for everything, for, for knowledge, for food, for for um, healing people, for educating, um, and had a lot of interests. Uh, so he had a big impact on his family as well. He wanted his, um, both his sons to become doctors, as he was, and uh, Charles's older brother, who was Erasmus II, another Erasmus, um, became a doctor. And Charles went off to medical school at Edinburgh, but never finished, didn't, didn't want to become a doctor. And so there was some friction there with his dad um, and what would happen um, with the rest of his life. His dad said at one point, um, you are worthless and you will be, do nothing other than uh, hunting and rat catching for the rest of your life and will make no impact. And well, he was wrong about that. <laughs> but um, he was very mad that his son wouldn't become a doctor. And so he said, the only thing that you could do, because of your station in society and your intellect, the only other thing you can do is join the clergy. And so then Charles studied to join the clergy at Cambridge, uh, and that didn't pan out either, um, <laughs> because he went off on the voyage of the Beagle. So we're, we're getting to that point soon. Um, so once again, there's our family tree. So I just wanted to mention that we just talked about um, Erasmus Darwin, uh, Robert Darwin's dad, who was Charles Darwin's dad. And we talked about Susanna Wedgwood, who was Josiah Wedgwood's daughter. And of course, we mentioned before that Erasmus and Josiah were really good friends, and there was a lot of intermarriages between uh, these families. So this brings us to Emma Darwin, uh, Nee Wedgwood. Um, she was also a really uh, amazing woman. We mentioned um, her dad's side of the family was the Wedgwoods. Her mom's side of the family were the Allens of uh, Cressley in Pembrokeshire. And so she had some ties through her mother's family to a different part of England and used to travel there and visit with people there as well. Um, when she was 10 years old, her father took her and her three sisters on what was known as the Grand Tour of Europe at the time. So if you were of a certain level of society, a certain wealth, you would go on the Grand Tour. And you would go to Paris and Geneva and Florence and Rome and Naples and Milan and you would study the art <coughs> and the poetry and the history and the science and the, and the current affairs. Um, Emma so was in a pretty high level of society. She, for example, took piano lessons from Chopin while she was on the Grand Tour. Um, he didn't teach her, but she took some lessons from him while she, while she was there. And uh, she also learned an awful lot from her uncle, who was a noted Italian historian. And he went by the name of Sismondi. And uh, I don't think that was his birth name. That was, I guess, his nom de plume. And so Sismondi um, taught her all about the intellectual and political affairs of the continent, of continental Europe. And this um, is something that, an interest in hers that lasted all her life. So she was not just a little homemaker that was interested in the kitchen. She was really a, a woman who was interested in, in the world, in intellectual pursuits, in music, in art, and also in causes. Um, she and her sister, when they were in their 20s, her sister Fanny, um, they both became really strong champions of the anti-slavery movement in the 1830s. And this was a pretty bold stance at the time, um, but they felt very strongly about it, and so did other people, and they supported it. Most of their family did, most Unitarians did as well, but they became very active in it. 
and she was really, really close to her sister Fanny. They were close in age, and they were as close as, as close sisters can be. And so when her sister died of cholera in her 20s, in 1832, it just devastated Emma. It was the most horrible thing that could have happened to her at the time. And through this intense grief, she developed a really strong, absolutely unshakable faith. And so she talks about that period of her life being the time where she became closest to her religious ties in the Unitarian religion. And so Emma was very much a woman who believed in the main tenets of the Bible and of God, um, but also had the strong intellectual side to her as well. And so it's very interesting, a lot of people make a, a, a big deal of the fact that a very religious woman, although well, not so strictly religious as most people at the time, a very religious Unitarian woman then married um, Charles Darwin, who would go on to strike fear into the hearts of many religious people with his, his um, advocacy of evolution. Um, but unlike that movie that some of you watched on Darwin Day, they didn't slam doors and yell at each other and scream and see ghosts and <coughs> cry out. Um, they actually had a really, really loving marriage, very strong marriage. and. Um, they supported each other, and she supported Charles. He never would have been able to do what he did without her. She never would have had the, the life that she wanted or the partner that could stimulate her and, 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 and love her quite so much. And uh, pretty much all of their writings from both of them say that they had a very, very close marriage. They spent every day together because they were in the house in the country with just their family. Um, they were married in 1839. They lived in London for a few years and then moved out to Downhouse in the country. And uh, all told, they had ten children together. Um, three of them died quite young, two of them as infants, and then one as when she was about ten years old. Many of you know about Annie, their daughter Annie, that died. Um, and so just to let you know their names, uh, in order, I believe, William, Anne, Mary, Henrietta, George, Elizabeth, Francis, Leonard, Horace, and then Charles Waring. Charles Waring was their last child who was one of the ones that died in infancy. Um, so they had seven children that lived to adulthood, not all of them that had children of their own, but some of them did have families, passing on um, the Darwin name through, through Charles and Emma. And uh, in fact, three of their children went on to become members of the Royal Society, and so they, they became men of science as well. Um, Emma really loved gardening. She loved trees. She created the six gardens that you saw in that picture of Down House before in the rear, and all of those were visible from their sitting room. So she wanted to have be able to view nature while they were in their home as well. Um, she and Charles were married for 43 years, and she outlived him by about 10 years, and lived to the age of 88. Um, I'd be happy to talk more about Emma and about their relationship, their home life. Um, I read a really good biography of Emma Darwin that you can find pretty easily as well. Um, and she was just a really interesting woman. Really loved her family and supported them. Um, so this is another um, just little piece of the family tree. And this shows um, Emma and Charles and how they were related through Josiah Wedgwood through two of his children. So um, we mentioned Susanna was uh, Charles's mom, and Josiah the second was Emma's dad. And then this is their ten children. So I don't expect you to memorize all that, but if you're curious, you want to look at it later on, talk about the dates, talk about the people, the order, we can, we can come back to this and talk about this some more if you want. So we are moving away from the family now. We can come back to the family if you guys have questions. If you have questions now, sure. Um, and Francis about, um, Francis about uh, Galton. What is it in, into the um, family tree? I have that family tree. He's asking about Francis Galton, who was another famous scientist yeah. um, related to Darwin. I think they called each other cousins, although it's a yeah, bit of a distant time. relation. So they can trace their ancestry both back to Erasmus. Okay. So Francis was a grandson of Erasmus through one of his daughters. Mm -hmm. Sorry, one of his yeah, one of his daughters who married a man named Samuel Galton, and then together they had the child Francis Galton. And uh, so they would be, I don't know who knows how cousins work, it's twice removed. If you, instead of your, your parents being related, your grandparents are related. I think it's second, 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 second cousin. Second cousin? Yeah, I always forget, twice removed by marriage, seconds by... Removing generations. Thank you. So they were second cousins. There we go. We figured it out. And uh, 
so Emma would have been second cousins as well because she was also related to Erasmus. Um, all right. Any other questions about the friends? Or sorry, the family, the direct family. Before we get into Darwin's friends and influences. Okay, we can always come back to these. Um, anybody has questions later on? So this is uh, Robert Edmund Grant, not a relative, but a, um, a teacher. He was a marine biology teacher at Edinburgh University, which we already mentioned Darwin was there for just a few years. Um, his older brother was already at Edinburgh, and so um, Charles was packed off to join him at the medical school. And Charles wasn't so much for into the medical side of things. This was back before there was any kind of uh, uh, chloroform or any other um, anesthesia, and so operations were done with people pretty much awake. And uh, it was a bloody, messy, horrible, screaming affair, and Darwin didn't like that so much, Charles. So he, um, he tended to uh, do more study of marine biology at the time. He was more interested in the natural history. And Robert Grant was a pretty big influence. They went on long walks together talking about marine biology, and, and, and he filled Charles's head with ideas of evolution. He was an evolutionary biologist at the time, or a believer in evolution. Um, especially the views of Lamarck. Uh, Lamarck always gets a, a short um, shrift in, uh, in scientific circles because of, he didn't quite get genetics right. But Lamarck got so much else right. And one of the things that he got right was that things evolved. One of the first really influential scientific thinkers in the area of evolution, a French scientist, and also a level, very high level of society. Um, and so Grant was, uh, was smitten with the ideas of Lamarck, and he was also a really radical free thinker. He was against the authority of the church. He saw no divine intervention in the natural world, which put him at loggerheads with most of his contemporaries, who saw a very strong divine pattern in nature. And so I think this potentially is one of the reasons why um, Grant would turn to his uh, relationships with his students. Because his students came out with a fresh mind, he could present them with the evidence, they could talk about it, they could, they could battle it out with wits, as opposed to his contemporaries who had already fixed in their minds that evolution couldn't be possible. Um, so this was probably, besides Zoonomia, besides his grandfather's work, this was probably Charles's first big influence in evolutionary thinking. But he didn't believe it at the time. He thought it was interesting, but he didn't really buy it. It wasn't until later that he came around on his own. Um, and this is to be contrasted a little bit with um, Darwin's most influential teacher at Cambridge. So he said Darwin, Charles left um, Edinburgh, decided he'd want to study medicine, traveled to Cambridge instead where he'd study for the clergy. But at the time, studying for the clergy really meant you were just a man of thinking. You were a natural philosopher. So you would, you would think about things, you would observe nature, you would look at God's plan. And so Darwin was there for the nature side. He really loved nature, loved being out and collecting things. And um, a big influence at the time was John Stevens Henslow, Reverend Henslow, who was a professor of botany at Cambridge, but another one of these guys that just did everything. He was a botanist, but he was also a geologist, a mineralogist. He also studied entomology, insects, mathematics, chemistry. He had a wide-ranging set of interests and uh, was pretty bright in all of these areas. He had the biggest influence on Charles's early scientific career. He had a very unconventional, for Cambridge, for the time, way of teaching, which was to take students out into nature. Imagine that. Instead of sitting around a table and lecturing at them, he would take them out on field trips, he would invite them to his house for informal dinners where they'd sit around and they would debate, they would read papers. So it wasn't just the sort of one person at the front of the uh, classroom um, talking about facts and was experiencing what science was like. And in fact, in 1830, he became a private tutor for Darwin um, for the areas of math and theology, but he also invited Charles to his botany lectures. And this is where Charles first got really interested in botany. He also, um, later on, had a huge influence on Darwin's life because he was the one who suggested Charles as the naturalist <coughs> or the beagle. He knew that Charles was a really promising student when he was at Cambridge, who loved both geology and botany and all areas of, of natural history. And so when a couple of more influential, well-established, older naturalists turned down the job, they said, three years sailing around the world, no thanks, I'd rather stay at home. Uh, they said, we need to find somebody young, somebody adventurous, somebody who is willing to 
to go off and eventually for five years sail around the world. And so he's the one that put forward uh, Charles's name. Um, our next influential scientist is Adam Sedgwick, who was one of the founders of modern geology. So we mentioned that Charles, before he became known for pigeons and barnacles, um, was mainly uh, a geologist and a botanist. He, um, Sedgwick was the first, well, he was the scientist who proposed the Devonian period. You've probably heard of the Devonian. Uh, you may have also heard of the Cambrian period. That's another one that he proposed. So he was the one that named them, he was the one that came up with the ideas. Um, the grand irony of this, I love this irony, is that while he taught Charles a lot about geology, in fact took him on a, on a field trip um, to Wales, uh, he later on was a very outspoken opponent of the theory of evolution by means of natural selection. So he liked rocks, he liked rocks being laid down one after another, but living things evolving, that's crazy talk. Um, so he named the Cambrian explosion, he named the Cambrian strata, but didn't believe that things evolved. That's, nowadays, that's kind of hard to, hard to wrap, wrap your mind around. We would love to take like Yeah, yeah. Devonian. Wouldn't be too into that. Um, so next we come to Captain Robert Fitzroy, who was the captain aboard the Voyage of the Beagle. So a little bit of background first about the voyage itself. Um, Fitzroy was the third captain of the boat that was named the Beagle. It was a boat of uh, her, His Royal Majesty's, HMS Beagle. It was part of uh, the Navy uh, run by the Admiralty. And its main job was not military, but it was to um, figure out the map, maps of, uh, of land, of water, of depths, of shoreline, to map out the shorelines. And so the voyage, the third voyage, the famous one, that uh, Charles was on, um, their mission was to map out the coast of South America. And in fact, their maps were so good and so meticulous and so accurate that they were used for uh, decades and decades, almost 100 years after the actual voyage. And in fact, some of these maps are still the best we have of certain areas of the coastline of, uh, of South America, at least in terms of cartography rather than uh, satellites and stuff. And. Um, Captain Robert Fitzroy was a very strong personality. He was a very religious man, as opposed to some of the other folks that we've been talking about. And uh, rather than being progressive, like a lot of Darwin, a lot of Charles's family, um, he was very pro-slavery. He was very pro-establishment. He was that, that quintessential British, we will rule the world, we're better than everybody. Um, but he was also a gentleman, and so he treated Charles very well, most of the time. Um, it's true that he wanted a dinner companion aboard the Beagle, who was of adequate social status that he could dine with. His social status was higher than all of the other officers and the men on board the ship, and so he couldn't dine with them. So he did want a dining companion, but contrary to a lot of um, talk of that's the only reason Charles was on board, Charles was hired as a naturalist. Um, he just happened to be a naturalist of well enough standing that he could also be a dinner guest. So he wasn't just there as a pet of, of Captain Fitzroy's, he was there as the naturalist aboard the Beagle, um, but they would dine together every evening. Question. Sure. It amused me to think, if Darwin had in fact been an atheist, like so many of his other family members, is it um, probable that he would not have been selected for the voyage of the Beagle? Ooh, that's a really good question. It's impossible to answer. If Darwin was um, an atheist, would he not have appealed to Fitzroy, um, not have been able to be brought aboard the, uh, the Beagle? Um, I'm not sure exactly how much Henslow told Fitzroy about his selection. I think it was sort of out of his hands. I think it was the criteria were he had to be somebody who was strong enough to go on this long voyage and, and, and trek around South America and collect things. Had to be somebody with some good geological and scientific and, and botanical knowledge, and had to be somebody of adequate social standing. So um, he probably knew that he was related to Erasmus. Um, so I don't think it was an issue how religious he was. I don't think that was one of the tests that he had to pass. But it certainly would have made the voyage much more difficult for them sharing such close quarters if they were um, at such loggerheads. The biggest argument came over slavery, where um, Fitzroy. <coughs> brought Darwin to a, they had argued about it a bit before, so he brought him to a, a slaver's mansion in South America, 
and said, um, asked all the slaves, do you like being slaves? And in front of their master, they said, oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Very much like being slaves. And the said, there you go. It proves it. They're cared for. They're, you know, uh, taken care of. And um, Charles was just fuming. He was so mad. He said, do you think their word means anything when they're standing in front of their master? And Fitzroy um, said, get out. Get out of my cabin right now. And he almost said, get off my boat. And Charles was sure that he was going to kick him off the, off the boat and send him back to England. Um, but he didn't. Fitzroy calmed down and he said, okay, we can hold different opinions on this. The subject won't come up again. Um, so it's nice at least that they agreed on some religious topics at the time. Um, Fitzroy did almost turn down Darwin on another matter. It wasn't because of his religious feelings. It was because Fitzroy was also a phrenologist. I don't know if you've heard of phrenology before, but it's the shape of your head. They would feel for bumps on your head to determine your personality. So the shape of your face, or the shape of your head, would be something that a phrenologist could read and tell everything about you. And so he took one look at Darwin and said, oh, no, 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 no. His nose is the wrong shape. Somebody with that nose would never be able to stand up to this voyage and be able to uh, carry out what we need to do. No, he's too lazy. I can tell right away just by looking at his nose. And so he had to meet with Charles a number of times, and Charles really, you know, strongly stated his case, and he said, I'll work, I'll work really hard, really I will, look at this letter from Henslow, so Fitzroy says, well, I don't know about the nose, but we'll give you a try, and uh, Charles worked really hard on that trip, um, he became ill quite later in life, Charles Darwin did, and so um, the voyage was sort of in the prime of his youth, he was hiking, he was out riding horses, he was adventuring, and then sort of the rest of his life he just sort of settled down and never never really left his house. Um, but he proved, he proved Fitzroy's phrenology wrong. Um, Fitzroy had a really interesting career as well. As we said, he was a very strong-willed man. Um, he, after sailing, he became a head of the weather charting department and actually made great strides in predicting the weather to save many lives uh, in England um, for the Admiralty. And eventually, was promoted to be the governor of New Zealand. So, you know, people at a certain status would be just given these plump positions. He knew nothing about governing and did a horrible job. You can imagine, he, he just, he didn't get along with people. He just told them what they looked like and what they should do. And people in New Zealand wouldn't have any of it. They almost killed him. He had to flee back to England to escape this horrible debacle he had in New Zealand. And uh, eventually he committed suicide, unfortunately. Um, he was always worried about this, and he told Darwin he was worried about this, because his, a number of people in his family had committed suicide, and in fact, one of the former captains of the Beagle had committed suicide. It's a tough life, being on this boat out by yourself uh, the whole time. And so, there was obviously something in his personality that was driving him away from other people, and um, I guess today we probably would have, you know, treated this as a mental illness and been able to figure out what was, what was wrong with his brain chemistry. Um, but he was a very complex guy, let's leave it at that for now. Also very interesting if you want to read um, more about him or his biography. Okay, so we'll go to much calmer waters. Um, Darwin's, Charles's closest friend was Joseph Dalton Hooker, a man with an extraordinary beard. Um, <laughs> he seems to have had that beard for most of his life. And hey, it worked for him. Um, <laughs> he came from a pretty uh, well-off family as well. His father was head of the Royal Botanical Gardens, Kew Gardens, um, a position that Joseph Dalton would later uh, acquire. So he also became head of the Royal Gardens at Kew. And um, he settled mostly on botany, but early on he was in medicine. So he was a surgeon. And he was a ship surgeon and traveled to Antarctica on one of the first major um, voyages to the magnetic south pole, and um, gathered amazing <coughs> natural stuff along the way. So he had his own voyage of the Beagle on a different boat. Um, he was came back, made close friends with Darwin, and was basically Darwin's main botanical fact gathering assistant. He carried out a lot of the uh, plant based research that led to uh, Darwin's thoughts on the origin of species, and the two of them um, worked together a lot on the ideas. Uh, they were definitely Charles's ideas. He had them first, but he shared them with Hooker and had somebody to bounce these ideas off of. He had very few people that he was willing to talk about his ideas having to do with um, natural selection. And um, 
Joseph Hooker uh, was really helpful in giving advice, not only in his thinking, but also on editorial advice, too. He helped um, read and edit and improve a lot of uh, Charles Darwin's writing as well. Um, another interesting fact is that uh, Joseph Hooker ended up marrying the daughter of Reverend John Stevens Henslow. There's another connection. Darwin's most influential teacher, his daughter, married Darwin's closest friend. Uh, all right, we've only got a few more left. We're getting close to, uh, to what I've got. Um, this is a name that you may have heard of before, Thomas Henry Huxley. If you haven't heard of the name of Huxley, you may have heard of him by his nickname, which was Darwin's Bulldog. Uh, Darwin was a very shy, retiring, quiet man. Uh, didn't like to directly confront his critics, maybe sometimes in writing, but never in person. Huxley was the opposite. He was a firebrand. He believed 100% in Darwin's writings when he first read them. In fact, he is said to have smacked his head and said, why didn't I think of this? <coughs> it's all so clear. It all makes so much sense. It makes sense of all of the observations in nature that you could make. Um, Huxley was mainly a morphologist. He studied the shape of, of animals, and he was mainly a primatologist. He worked mostly with mammals, mostly with primates like apes and monkeys, and um, really studied their, uh, their physical structure, their bones and their morphology, and um, was also a, a surgeon. You're seeing a common theme here, men of science, men of medicine. And uh, he also sailed on a boat that traveled around the world. Um, it was called the HMS Rattlesnake. And so there is another cool book out there, if you're collecting titles to read, called Darwin's Armada. <laughs> and it's not, it's not a literal title. They weren't Darwin's Armada, but it was all these people that were of Darwin's age and um, friends who all went off on these amazing boat trips to explore the world. And so Huxley was one of them, and uh, Hooker was one of them, and our next name, Wallace, was one of them as well. Um, and this is how, at the time, you experienced nature. You had to get on a boat, and it took months and months or years to travel to another continent, and you, for yourself, could see firsthand the amazing variety of uh, plants and animals that would be there. So this, uh, Huxley was the, the strongest offender of Darwin's theory of evolution. He did uh, the, the fighting, the groundwork, to convince other people. Um, Charles once said that uh, scientific people are no, of no worth whatsoever after the age of 65, um, because they have set in their minds so much that they'll never accept anything new. Um, in fact, he made an offhand comment, we should just kill all scientists over a certain age, they're of no use to us. Um, and his mentors, who were older than that, said, I don't know about that idea, can you stick around please? But it's true that a lot of the people Charles's age or older wouldn't accept these new theories, but the younger ones who would see the evidence, read the theory fresh, would say, yeah, this makes sense. This is how the world works. And so Huxley was one of those, uh, a complete uh, disciple of Darwin's in some ways. Um, he would try and uh, not only advance the idea of natural selection among scientists, but also among the public. He gave a lot of great speeches about this and engaged in debates. Uh, he, he was in a really famous debate with a bishop by the name of Wilberforce, uh, who uh, was a staunch uh, critic of evolution in general, not just natural selection, which was Charles' area, but of any kind of evolution, very strict creationist. And um, Huxley debated him in public, and uh, Wilberforce, the, the, the one quote that everybody remembers from this big debate is that Wilberforce said, I, I wouldn't... I can't believe that you would want to be considered the, um, the grandson of an ape. That's what everybody was so upset about, that humans and apes were related. Huxley was the first to actually publicly come out and say humans were primates. And, uh, and Huxley shot back right away. I would rather be related to an ape than be related to somebody whose mind is so closed they could never accept what's right in front of their face. <laughs> I welcome being related to an ape. I hate to say that I was in any way related to you. And, uh, and so they, you know, would, would go back and forth. But Darwin was a little reticent about approaching the idea of human evolution. He later on wrote a book about, about human evolution, and, but in the origin, so in his first sort of 60 years, he didn't want to go near the topic. And he had one line in the entire origin saying that these ideas might shed light on 
human origins. <laughs> and he just left it at that. <laughs> you might learn something about humans. Well, I'm not going to say anything else. But Huxley said, the heck with that. I'm going to publish a whole book about humans or apes. And he showed the skeletons of primates and, and human skeletons. <coughs> and they're all the same bones. They look the same. It's, it's obvious. And, uh, and that got a lot, of, a lot of press, but a lot of criticism as well. Um, so this brings us to uh, our final figure, um, another one of the most influential figures in Darwin's life, Alfred Russell Wallace. Um, hopefully you know Wallace's name as well as Darwin's because he is and should be celebrated as the equal co-creator of the idea of natural selection. Um, I am definitely on the side that Darwin deserves all the credit that he gets, but he shouldn't get the credit as the sole designer of the idea of natural selection. Wallace came up with it about the same time, completely independently of Charles. Let me back up a bit, um, and then we'll talk about... Didn't Charles Darwin have that idea long before? He just didn't publish it until he saw the... Uh, That's right. Yeah, yeah. so I'm, I'm getting there. I'm okay. getting there. I'm going to get up to that point where they're actually published. But um, uh, we should celebrate Wallace Day just as often as we celebrate Darwin Day, because uh, uh, he was a really impressive scientist as well. There were some problems which may explain why he's not quite so warmly accepted. I'll get to that as well. Okay, so let's back up to uh, Wallace's youth. Um, Charles Darwin, as we said, came from a super wealthy family. He never had to work a day in his life. Um, so he could basically pursue his scientific interests just as his day-to-day -day activities. Wallace was the opposite. He came from a not su such well-off family, and um, he had to make his living in the world. And he also had a really, really strong interest in natural history, and so he had hit upon the quite brilliant idea of collecting natural history, uh, collecting organisms, butterflies, lizards, skeletons, pelts, skins, fish, um, because there was this mania in Europe at the time to have these amazing collections of natural history. So if you go to the Beattie Biodiversity Museum, for example, they have inherited some collections that date back to the 1800s, where people would have in their homes these special uh, displays of all these amazing butterflies, for example, or all these amazing um, monkeys that have been stuffed and posed. And so wealthy people would want these things in their homes, and so there was a lot of money to be made to go out and collect them and to bring back and sell them. So Wallace thought, this is great. I can go out and I can observe nature as a scientist. I can observe them and collect them for myself, but at the same time, I can make a living at it. So he decided to pack off to South America, and he lived um, in the Amazon for several years, doing nothing but collecting and collecting and collecting and collecting. He amassed this amazingly huge collection, worth a tremendous amount of money, and uh, brought it on board a ship to sail back to England to make his fortune. He got about halfway back, the boat caught on fire, and sunk, losing everything on board. Not all the people, most of them made it out on lifeboats. Supposedly they woke up Wallace, who was in a deep sleep, and said, in a very British way, Sir, the boat is on fire. He <laughs> said very calmly, Oh, I suppose we will have to get a lifeboat. <laughs> and there wasn't any panicking, I just imagine this. As written by the people who described it, they weren't panicking, they just very orderly got on board the boat, sort of watched their boat catch on fire and sink below the ocean. And you can only imagine what was going through Wallace's head. This was years of his life. This was going to be his that's great fortune. Um, but the great thing I love about Wallace is he didn't turn to alcoholism. He didn't uh, you know, decide to, to just throw his life away and say, that's it, I'm, I'm done with it. He said, um, I'll do it again. <laughs> I'll go to Asia this time. So he packed off to what was called the Malay Archipelago um, in Southeast Asia, uh, which is now just sort of the area north of, of Australia, and um, spent years and years again doing the same thing, collecting, traveling around, amassing this amazing collection. This time, however, he sent it back bit by bit. <laughs> so he'd collect a bunch and he'd send that bit back and collect a bit more and send it back. Um, and he did make a good living at this. Um, but uh, while he was in the Malay archipelago, he developed malaria, as a lot of people did at the time. They didn't have any way to prevent it. And uh, he was unable to sleep, unable to work, because he just had these horrible fevers and would be laying in bed. And so he'd just lay there and he'd just think. Sometimes these fevered thoughts racing through his head. Sometimes he'd have moments of calm where he'd be able to rationally put things together. But he said lying there in this malaria bed allowed him to really think carefully about the observations he had been making. And he came upon a way of explaining it. 
And it's the exact same idea that Darwin had been working on, as Pat said, for the past 20 years. Darwin hadn't published it at that point. He was still collecting information. He knew this was an idea that would, would rock the scientific world, and he wanted to be as strong an argument as he could. And so he was collecting more and more information before publishing. Um, and Charles had only shared his ideas with a select few, some of his geological uh, mentors. He had shared it with Hooker. He had shared his ideas with his wife. Um, not too many other people. And then he gets this letter from Alfred Russell Wallace. So Charles Darwin had been established at that point. He had published a lot about the voyage of the Beagle, which is not about transmutation of species, not about natural selection. And so he was a well-known man of science. And so Wallace wrote to Darwin and said, uh, I have this idea, and I would like for you to take a look at it, and if you think highly of it, could you please pass it on to the men that you know in scientific circles? And Darwin read it, and he just, he just felt his heart drop to the floor, because the ideas were exactly the same ideas of natural selection that he had been working on, and in fact, some of the terms that Wallace had independently invented were headings in Darwin's abstract, <laughs> the exact same kinds of terms. So the paper that Wallace had sent to him in 1858, it's a nine-page paper, and it was called On the Tendency of Varieties to Depart Indefinitely from the Original Type. Not quite as poetic as some of Erasmus' stuff, or, uh, <laughs> or not quite as uh, ringing as The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, but it gets the idea across. These varieties from a type changing over time and diverging, and this was the idea of natural selection. And he had the mechanism there, he had everything. So um, Wallace uh, absolutely could claim that uh, natural selection is his idea independently, but as we had mentioned, Darwin had come up with the idea 20 years earlier and had been working on it nonstop. So even though both of them had the idea, it was absolutely Darwin's evidence that convinced scientific men. They probably would have looked at Wallace's idea and just dismissed it. Well, if Darwin hadn't published, why did Wallace pick him to write to? because of the Voyage of the Beagle. Um, Darwin was quite well known from his publications about geology, about coral reefs, about um, the zoology of the Voyage of the Beagle. And so he, he and Wallace had the same interests. They traveled to different places. They observed this amazing variation. They described it. They talked about um, how they might be related to each other, which is kind of a, new, a newish idea. Um, so for example, when Darwin was on the Galapagos Islands, um, everybody talks about Darwin's finches now, which are great, but they were only really recognized after the fact. When Darwin was there, he was impressed by the mockingbirds and by the turtles. He would go from island to island and see these really similar kind of animals on a different island. They were different enough that you could recognize them as not the same thing. And that's what really started to get him puzzling. So you're right, he hadn't published those ideas, but he was an established man of science who traveled and who had cataloged for variations and variety. And Wallace said, you know, I'm seeing the same thing you're seeing. I think this is how we explain it. And he didn't realize that Darwin had been working on that same idea. But he picked the right guy to send it to. And the other reason he picked the right guy to send it to, this is what I think is really incredible about the relationship between Charles and, and Alfred, um, was that uh, Charles could have just <coughs> ripped it up, tossed it in the fire, said, oh, sorry, got lost in the post, I didn't get it, and published his own idea independently. But instead, he said, no, 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 I, I can't now, in good conscience, publish my ideas to try and rush them ahead of Wallace. Really, Wallace, I should let Wallace publish his ideas, he was sort of being a gentleman about it, and then I'll write my book later on, in which case Wallace would have been known as the first originator of his ideas. But Darwin's friends convinced him, no, 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 you've been working on this idea, this is your idea. Wallace came up with it independently, so what we should do is we should present them together. And that's what they did. They read both papers. Darwin wrote a, a short little couple-page abstract, and they read Wallace's nine-page paper and Darwin's short little abstract together as both presenting the same idea. But even they read them, nobody cared. Mm -hmm. They thought, ah, I'm not interested. This is not true. It, it didn't match what their ideas of how the world worked were. And so they just couldn't believe it, couldn't accept the idea. So then it wasn't until the next year, so Darwin feverishly put together all of his writings that he'd been working on, and he, he released The Origin, and that's what convinced people. It was the logic of the argument backed up by the evidence, and the evidence from all over the place, not just the Malay archipelago in Asia, but 
worldwide. Darwin had collected his own information and had gotten people mailing them his ideas, their observations, um, other specimens. And so he had amassed this huge amount of evidence. And you just couldn't look at that evidence and say, <coughs> things weren't related to each other. They don't change over time. And so he was, he's really the father of the acceptance of evolution. I would, a lot of people call Charles Darwin the father of evolution. But the idea was much older than that. That could go to Erasmus or Lamarck or some or even earlier thinkers. But he was the one that convinced people how it happened through natural selection. And so Wallace struck upon that same idea. Uh, however, we're going to get to sort of the other side of Wallace's personality. This is where they differed. Um, Charles Darwin sort of moved a little further and further away from his religious beliefs, realizing it was a scientific view of, of nature that would explain the world. Wallace, however, um, thought that it was a higher spiritual power that was in charge of evolution, and that there would, he proposed an upward evolution of human morals over time, which would eventually lead to a socialist utopia. Now, hey, who's not for a socialist utopia? Um, but he thought it was this evolution of morals over time, God's <coughs> guiding hand. So obviously, it was Englishmen who were further along in the evolution of morals compared to everybody else. And then there may be only one or two steps above Englishmen to get to the, the socialist utopia. Um, so he held a number of <coughs> ideas. He was also really into spiritualism, which was a pretty big thing at the time. Uh, a lot of influential thinkers were. Arthur Conan Doyle, the author of Sherlock Holmes, was a big spiritualist as well. And um, so Wallace sort of went a little bit off the track of science later in his career. And so Charles Darwin always had a close relationship with him. They were, they were buddies, and they would write back and forth, and they shared their ideas. But then Wallace would propose these ideas of how man's morality was evolving, or how it's all guided by a spiritual power, or how ghosts are controlling your life. And, and Charles would say, OK, OK. And he wouldn't complain. He wouldn't, he wouldn't put down Wallace in public, but he would just sort of distance himself a little bit. So he's got his ideas. I've got my ideas. I don't think I agree with those, um, because uh, Charles was very much a man of science. Uh, by the end of his life, he was a staunch agnostic. He said, we don't know. We just can't figure it out. Uh, I know that the natural world, natural laws, are enough to explain everything around me, and that's good enough for me. Um, and so he also eventually came to grips with, uh, with his wife's religious beliefs as well. He said, just like his grandfather Erasmus said, maybe there was a first cause. We can't tell. We weren't around when the universe was created. Um, so sure, call that whatever you want. But don't tell me that there is a guiding hand of creation or design in every single aspect of the living world. And luckily, Erasmus was okay with that. Emma was okay with that. Wallace. Maybe not so much. <laughs> um, is there any truth in the rumor that um, it was Darwin's study of the Newman fly which was fundamental in uh, undermining his religious views that the cruelty of um, paralyzing a sentient creature and laying eggs so that the poor thing was being eaten alive by maggots? Uh, Darwin said, no, uh, uh, any biblical god creator would not permit such a cruel abomination. Yeah, so Darwin did say that. Darwin was, did point to things like <coughs> parasites and, and the cruelty of the natural world. He used the term the devil's chaplain, which then became a title of a Dawkins book later on. Um, he said that any creator that created all of uh, the horrible side of nature things that, that kill and hurt and mutilate and, and, and torture other living things, like, uh, like certain kinds of parasites and parasitoids, um, would have only been able to be created by a devil's chaplain, not by a, by a religious figure that wanted to do good. Um, so I think that, yes, he very much held that view. But I would disagree with the point that it was looking at these flies that, that made him come to that decision. I think it was sort of a more of a gradual, general looking at all of the evidence and, and thinking about it carefully and making up his own mind. So he could point to that as an, as an example, uh, like David Attenborough loves to do as well, when people ask him about uh, nature and design. Um, he says, well, if you believe in the design of the goodness of nature, you have to believe in the design of the parasites that will bore through a young child's eye until he's blind. Um, 
So I think he borrowed that, that kind of thinking from Darwin. Darwin maybe borrowed it from someone else. So it was, it was probably around uh, at the time. And it wasn't any one thing that convinced him. It was just very careful thinking. Darwin wasn't, um, as far as I can tell, wasn't someone that would leap to a conclusion. He wouldn't see something and go, aha, this must be true. A lot of people think science is about a moment or a, a, an example. Um, whereas Charles himself described his mind as slowly grinding away at facts. He'd gather more and gather more. And they'd sit and they'd work together and he'd think them over for years, for decades. And eventually he would start to come to gradual conclusions. Um, but I think he would agree with you that uh, that's a pretty good argument against perfect design. So um, the only other thing I have, besides I'd be happy to, to discuss this some more, answer questions, is I thought I'd, I'd share a little bit of Alfred Russell Wallace's writing as well. So we've heard a bit from uh, Erasmus, uh, we've heard from, from Darwin. Let's hear from Wallace. So this is Wallace in a letter that he wrote in 1849, um, and he's describing uh, the Amazon rainforest. So he says, there is, however, one natural feature of this country, the interest and grandeur of which may be fully appreciated in a single walk. It is the virgin forest. Here no one who has any feeling of the magnificent and sublime can be disappointed. The somber shade, scarce illuminated by a single direct ray, even of the tropical sun. The enormous size and height of the trees, most of which rise like huge columns a hundred feet or more without throwing out a single branch. The strange buttresses around the base of some, the spiny or furrowed stems of others. The curious and even extraordinary creepers and climbers which wind around them, hanging in long festoons from branch to branch, sometimes curling and twisting on the ground like great serpents, then mounting to the very tops of the trees, and thence throwing down roots and fibers which hang waving in the air, or twisting around each other, throwing <coughs> ropes and cables of every variety of size, and often of the most perfect regularity. These and many other novel features parasitic plants growing on the trunks and branches, the wonderful variety of the foliage, the strange fruits and seeds that lie rotting on the ground, taken all together, surpass description, and produce feelings in the beholder of admiration and awe. It is here, too, that the rarest birds, the most lovely insects, and the most interesting mammals and reptiles are to be found. Here lurk the jaguar and the boa constrictor. And here, amid the dense shade, the bell bird tolls his peal. So I just love how evocative their writing is. A lot of these folks, so any of them, you could read Hooker and Huxley and Wallace and Darwin. So people point to Darwin as being you know, beautifully descriptive, and, and it is Origin of Species is one of the most readable scientific texts of all time. Uh, don't try and read Newton uh, from First Principles. It's just you can't get through it. You don't have his mind. You'd work your whole life to, to understand a page or two. Well, at least I would. I, I shouldn't speak for you. Pat probably has read Newton and he gets it just fine. I've read a few pages. <laughs> it, it, it makes my eyes hurt. <laughs> um, he proved everything by Euclid first before he didn't even mention his flexio. Yeah, you gotta you gotta really know some good background to understand like every term and every sentence. But the origin, you can pick up and you can read it. You can read it like a novel. Like it's, it's, it's a little archaic, you know, it's a little poetic, long sentences, but it's just readable. And so at, in his time, everyone was able to access this information. It wasn't just the scientists or just the upper crust. Um, there are stories of coal miners who would scrap together their pennies and together buy one copy and sit around and read it after working long days to learn about well, buzz, what everybody was talking about. So there were cheap versions that people could access, and they could understand it. They could understand pigeons. They see them every day, or pigeon fanciers. Now they come in all these shapes and varieties and forms. Um, but uh, it's also, I think, the beauty of the language that, that really interests <coughs> me as well. These men worked hard. They um, traveled. They were under terrible conditions. But what they saw was the most amazing thing they had ever seen in their life. They didn't have TV, they didn't have photographs, they didn't have the internet, they couldn't view the rest of the world, so they went there. And when they went there, it was so unlike their places at home that it just sort of filled their hearts with the poetry of it. And so they were celebrating not only the science and the nature, 
but the beauty and the appreciation of it as well. And so that's one of the things that I really um, take from, from Wallace's writing. Um, by the way, Wallace is not known, he's not only known as one of the co-creators of the idea of natural selection, but a founder of whole fields of ecology and biogeography. So he was thinking about where animals were distributed and where plants were distributed and how they would be distributed over large places and large areas. And uh, so he made some really amazing, um, uh, impressive improvements in science as well outside the area of evolutionary biology. Um, so those are all the folks that I wanted to talk about. Thanks for joining me on a trip of looking at Darwin's family, his friends, and his influences. So thanks a lot, guys. <laughs>
if a person makes a very significant contribution to a scientific field and elects to stay in that field long enough, they will eventually become an impediment to that field's further <laughs> progress. Mm -hmm. And the severity of that impediment is directly proportional to the importance of the original contribution. I, I don't know if that was well, uh, that's certainly the guy that you're referring to in your room. It fits along with Charles's view of scientists not accepting new ideas after a certain time, and that, that definitely can be true. Um, but uh, I don't think we could accuse Charles of that. I don't think he was an impediment to his own ideas later on, um, because he just kept collecting evidence, trying to build upon it. He wasn't trying to say, I can explain it all, and that, that's where I think where Wallace fell down. Wallace said, I can explain it all, it's all gods or ghosts or spirits or something like that. Charles didn't say that. He said, um, let's just look at the facts. Let's look at the evidence and figure out what we can figure out from this. So he would study smaller and more intricate systems, how barnacles reproduced, how plants could crawl up a, a, a tree trunk. Um, and he took all these little facts and, and kind of drew them together. So I think he added to our knowledge rather than becoming an impediment later on, which is kind of nice. Um, you said that uh, the movie uh, <coughs> Creation. Yeah. Um, that uh, the fighting between uh, Darwin and Emma uh, was like not true. Um, well, it, we don't know. I mean, that that was is poetic license or dramatic license. Because I was just wondering, because um, did do, is there any documentation or anything talking about how they dealt with raising the kids in terms of religion? Oh, in terms of religion, that's a good question. Um, I think that um, from what I remember of. Emma's, the biography of Emma that I read, uh, she raised all the children in Unitarianism as she was raised, and, and Charles had no problem with that. Um, but I'm sure he also gave them a good free-thinking attitude as well. So he did a lot of uh, educating his children. That's one of my favorite parts of that movie, is his relationship with his children. He teaches them, he talks to them, he shows them things. And I think that was really nice, and I think that is backed up by everything that I've read about the family, is that he did have this close relationship with his children. They would come running in when he'd be working, and they weren't supposed to bother him, but every once in a while they would, and he would show them something, or he would give them something, or give them a little task to help him out, and so he involved them in, in his life, um, which was a bit unusual at the time. But part of the thing I didn't like about that movie was it showed, or it emphasized, let's say, the philosophical disagreements between Emma and Charles, and I think, um, people of that era, the Victorian and pre-Victorian era, um, wouldn't have externalized that like modern people would. Mm -hmm. uh, not to say that they weren't people and humans and stuff like that, but they had much more um, set social structure on how you behave with people. Mm -hmm. And so I think they were a little more reserved than that. I think they loved each other very much, um, according to every everything that's ever been written about them. Um, and yes, Emma worried that they might not be able to be together in an afterlife. And um, I think that was one of those things that Charles just said. He, he was upset about it as well, but he just said, this is something we're going to have to just disagree on, have our own opinions. I think she was able to accept that because she was also an intellectual as much as she was a woman of faith. And um, the nice thing I, from what I've read about the Unitarian faith is that that's acceptable. Science is perfectly fine. Science and God go, go nicely together in their, in their own belief system. Um, so it wasn't a matter of her giving up her religion to believe her husband, or about him needing to accept her religion for them to get along. It's that they were both comfortable in their own way of looking at the world, and that uh, she edited a lot of his papers, she read a lot of his ideas, and I think she was pretty supportive of a lot of them. So it wasn't so I think they played up her religious side a little bit too strongly in that movie. She was she was of strong faith, but I don't think she was uh, um, like trying to convert people left and right or anything like that. I think that. The, the vicar in that movie had a collar, might have been an Anglican, but it wasn't really specified. So the the church in Down could have very well been Anglican. So they went to a Unitarian school, but then there probably was only one church in the town, and so that's probably where they went. And actually, Charles got along quite well with the with the local um, church people, and he he was the richest guy in town, and would you know uh, help support a lot of people in the town, help support a lot of the poor people, and, and help them with their their medicine as well. 
um, his dad being a doctor and everything. And um, so he was really well looked upon by, uh, by the people of Down. It wasn't like he was an outcast or anything like that. And he used to go with his family to church quite often um, until a certain age. He just decided, mm, I don't think I need to do this anymore. And so he would walk his family to church. They would go to church and he would go for a walk in the countryside while they were in church. And it's, everybody seemed to be okay with that, as far as we could tell. <coughs> So I don't think they would have slammed doors in each other's faces. Hmm. That's just not my feeling for the people as much as I can read about them. And of course, I only know them through what's been written about them and what they've written themselves, so that can always revise how actual reality was. But they just don't seem like those kind of people. I think if they were upset, they would sort of sit down and have a nice calm chat about it. And, uh, and maybe write letters. <laughs> write letters to each other, even though they lived in the same house. 